Thank you very much. So welcome to today's meeting of the Jones Library Building Committee. Uh, we are meeting virtually by permission of the governor and uh, will this event will be recorded and available on the town website. So just to make sure that we're all, we can hear and speak, uh, I will call your name if you would signify your presence vocally. Sharon Sherry. Here. Thank you, Alex. Here. Thank you, Paul Bockelman. Present. George. Here. Thank you, Anika. Anika. Here. Thank you, and I'm Austin Sarrett. So, the first order of business is the, oh, Christine, I forgot to call on you, Christine. Here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, the first order of business is the approval of the minutes from June 7th. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Are there any corrections to the minutes? Okay. I'm going to ask you to signify your approval of the minutes. Sharon? Yes. Christine? Yes. Um, Alex? Yes. Paul? Yes. George? Yes. Anika? Yes. And Austin votes yes. Uh, the next item is the financial update, but Sean Mangano is not present. So we will skip that item. If he shows up, we will uh, ask him. And if not, we will lay it over to the next. Next is a report from Colliers. Craig, it's nice to, nice to see you and members of your, your, your team. It's also nice to see folks from FAA. Thank you so much for joining. Craig. Thank you, Austin. Um, so I think um, one of the things that we had that we want to go over today and sort of taking things kind of out of order is the design team is here, both Josephine and Steve, and they've got um, several um, updates to, to make to the uh, building committee tonight. So um, maybe before we get into any of the other um, things on my agenda, I'd like to turn things over to them if that's okay with you so we can maximize their the benefit of their time with us. Absolutely, thank you. Awesome. So uh, Josephine and Steve have uh, a number of things. Um, well, they've got some information for us about the gender inclusive toilets. Uh, I believe some information about a proposed elevator uh, relocation, um, possibly some other things that I'm forgetting at the moment, but <laughs> I'll turn things over to them. Great. Hi everyone, <laughs> thanks Greg. Um, yeah, we'll start with the um, the gender neutral bathroom layouts, and then we can sort of take it from there and walk through whatever you folks would like to further. Um, but oh, I guess first thing I should share my screen. <laughs> Do I have the ability to to share? Angie, does she have the ability to share? Looks like I do. Absolutely, yes. As okay. a panelist, you do. Thank okay. you so much. So everybody can see my screen, I assume? Yes. Great. And if it's not large enough to view, just let me know. I can escape from this viewing mode and get um, zoomed in into um, certain locations. Um, but yeah, so we'll review restrooms um, first. And, and to start that off, um, we thought we would just show the ground floor plan here because this is the area that we um, were looking at um, for these um, gender inclusive restrooms. Um, so this is the ground level as everybody recalls from our previous meetings and these are the restrooms right here if you can see my cursor on the screen. Yep. So we'll just dive right in I know um, time is uh, precious for everybody. Um, and what we're doing here for these um, design options that we're looking at is um, sort of taking it back um, to like 60,000 foot view. Um, we're sort of looking at three options. And we're calling them light, medium, and heavy, um, mainly because um, we'll go through the, the reasonings behind them all, but um, light being the um, most or the least changes to the current layout that we have. 
it's basically like minimal impact to the design that's currently there. Um, it's more of a signage change than anything, but um, what you'll see in this layout is that we are showing both toilets and urinals in both restrooms. What this basically does is provide you two restrooms identical. Um, one thing that we still have to look into is quantities. And of course, that'll all be um, tied into the code report as we further the design. Um, so once we have quantities established, um, we'll figure out how many toilets and urinals we need in each restroom, but it'll be identical. And um, the only thing that's really a change here is the signage on the door. Um, and it's, as we said, a minimal change. Um, so um, this would be our light option. The next option, as we're calling medium, um, is moderate change to the current floor plan. Um, this would remove the urinals from both options or both restrooms, but you still do have two restrooms. And what you have here is just toilets in each restroom. Again, the signage would reflect the universal design. And, um, and we're calling this moderate. As you can see here, there is a fixture change and, um, and it would still allow future um, being able to go back in the future if you wanted to um, to sort of change up the signage, that would still be the um, only change that you would really have to do if if you wanted to go back down the road um, to make any you know further changes or go back to um, how things um, were previously with your signage. Um, and then the last one is the heavy option, and this is the biggest change. Um, this would um, have the most significant impacts to um, the design. Um, this also would be a little bit more difficult to go back to if you wanted to um, down the road. Um, and this would also um, change the cost a little bit um, because as you can see here, um, this would be a single room with um, just toilet stalls. Um, it's a one room for all setup and um, what you have is um, just one bay of sinks that everybody would be using. So we are showing this as closed off. We do understand that some folks because of privacy concerns do like to leave them open. Um, and so it's more of an airport type configuration or layout, if you will. Um, but there are some um, establishments that do have these rooms closed off. With that said, a lot of times that you see layouts like this, they do also have adjoining family rooms or you know unisex toilet stalls like we have on level one. And that's something that we could look into because we probably will have the space if it's laid out in this way. Um, we could potentially use one side for the, um, uh, the restroom and then we could have some of the leftover space that um, is on one of the sides for the janitor's closet and the unisex toilet stall, if that was desired. Um, Josephine, again, uh, be yes. before, before you go forward, could you tell us a little bit about the cost implications of the moderate heavy, what, what are the differences in terms of the cost? Yeah, so um, with, heavy, the, the biggest thing here is probably security. So um, a lot of these types of layouts will have full floor to ceiling closure on the toilet stalls. Mm -hmm. And that's where the impact on cost um, changes a bit. Um, this has the, probably the most significant cost difference. And we don't know exactly what that is yet. Um, we've okay. seen different ranges uh, just online, but we haven't looked into it um, into into it m too much further, but what what's going on with full height stalls is um, more material, mm -hmm. um, lighting impacts, uh, ventilation impacts, potential floor drains, things like that of that nature. Once you close off each stall, um, and that's sort of where the more of the cost implications come in into play um, for this layout. Um, medium and light, um, I think it's probably minimal um, changes okay. because you're looking at just changing out fixture types. Okay. 
And I don't uh, know, Craig, if you have anything to add as far as costs go, but those are like the initial big picture costs that we think would be, um, you know, most significant. I see a couple of hands up, but I, I will say, you know, your what you described as the cost that that matches my understanding as well. Okay, I see George and then Paul. George, uh, do any of these changes decrease uh, spaces surrounding it? Like, do these do any of these put footprints increase in size over the original plan? So, in these layouts, we're using the same footprint. Great. Now, until we get further clarification from our code consultant on the quantities, um, I think we were a little conservative here. Um, I don't see us necessarily needing more fixtures, but um, until we get that um, squared away with the code consultant, um, that would be the only thing that might um, increase it. But I think we are kind of conservative on the counts right now. So, so we're probably pretty close to the square footage that we would need. Okay. Paul, could you just scroll back to medium and light again, yeah. please? Should we go back to light first? Sure. Okay. Paul, did you have specific questions or you just wanted to see them again? Yes, I mean, I mean the, the thing, when we talk about signage, I mean, there's two things. One is I'm gonna ask about changing tables for diapers and for babies and stuff, but um, I assume that that's gonna be included. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the way I like to see things is just to describe what's inside, just like, you know, um, two toilets, one urinal, or, you know, three, three, year, three toilets with one building and, and one toilet, one urinal, and let people choose where they want to go by the fixtures as opposed to some other identifying features. I mean, my sense is, um, yeah, I, yeah, um, I'd rather have one bit, one room that has all um, toilets and then one room that has a mixture. Huh. Okay. Alex and then Christine. Alex. Um, thanks. Um, Josephine, I assume, because um, you don't know the um, code requirements yet, do are all the fixtures contemplated for um, accessibility or is it contemplated that only one is or just curious if that's different between the three designs or how that's factored in people in wheelchair that, accessibility is mostly what i'm thinking about yeah sure yes um that will depend on the route we take um if we have two stalls we would need or have two restrooms we would need what we have here which is mm -hmm. both restrooms would need to have um, an ADA stall, from my understanding. The one thing that might change slightly is um, if we have to go for a variance for um, one or more of these options. We definitely would need a variance for option three, the heavy option. Um, that's another thing that we um, still have to investigate further. But our code, cons we did get in touch with our code consultant, and um, and he uh, most definitely thinks we would need a variance um, from the state for option three. Um, the, the first um, couple of options sometimes um, can be done through the health inspector and the local you know, plumbing inspector. Um, and sometimes they're kind of um, easygoing about that sort of thing when it's a signage change, more so than creating a room for all with you know, a multi fixture um, situation. That's our understanding so far, but I think we would need to dive in a little bit further um, to figure that out. But back to the um, question on accessibility, um, it sort of depends on which layout we go, but we go with, but we would need to see how many counts that we would need for accessibility stalls. But of course, we'll, you know, dig into that, you know, with the code once we, you know, have direction. Okay, Christine. Yeah, um, not to dive too much into bathroom function, but as a woman, I never use urinals. Um, and the difference between the light and the medium mostly seems to be the um, urinals or toilets. And as a woman, 
what I've noticed in public spaces, there always seems to be a line at the women's room and rarely at the men's. Um, so I'm just a little concerned that I don't understand the light, what the benefit is when half, half the population or whatever can't use a urinal. So how do you get away with that and plumbing code and why wouldn't you, because everybody can use toilets, why wouldn't you just go with toilets? But I don't use urinals, so. <laughs> Josephine? Yeah, so I think that's just the having two restrooms for all situation. So you can go into either one and anybody can use it. Um, but I think some people also want that ability to revert, you know, back if they wanted to and just have that flexibility just, you know, to go either way with the floor plan layout, I think. Um, I'm not quite sure if they <clears throat> choose to have this, um, you know, I think it's by establishment, by codes, you know, local codes. I think um, every state too is different and um, people are just seeing, it's, it's still sort of new for a lot of um, establishments, you know, going this direction. So I think um, everybody's finding um, different ways of setting it up for, for their establishment. Um, what's best and what's not, but they're trying to figure it, figure it out still, I think. Um, and of course, you know, after talking with um, our code consultant and, um, you know, understanding, having a conversation with um, the health department and local inspector, I think um, that will weigh in on some of the decisions that, that get made down the road as well. Christine, did that answer your question? I just have one. So again, with the urinals, I'm thinking like in libraries, we have a lot of families and kids and I, I do have two girls and boy, but kids usually just use the toilet, not urinals also just thinking numbers. Like, I don't know how that enters into the option. I'm just really like between the light and the medium, it just seems to be the difference of the urinals. And is that I know it's part of the gender inclusivity, but it, it, if we're trying to go for usability with most people, wouldn't you just go with toilets? I'm still confused by this. Uh, Josephine, did you want to say anything else about this at this point? Because we have more questions. Um, I'm not sure I've got anything more to add to it. Um, so what I'm understanding your response, I'm sorry to interrupt you, what I understand your response to Christine to be is that the, the reason to go with the light option is if someday one were to say, we don't want gender inclusive um, restrooms, then you would have urinals and toilets. Is that, is that what your, is that what the answer or question is? Well, I, I think, I think what I would first say is just that if you want to go to the gender inclusive route that anybody can enter either room and use any of the fixtures that they would like. It's for everybody. So one person doesn't necessarily need to go to this restroom because they want to use a urinal. I think the idea is really to make them the same. And at the end of the day, that's whether it's all toilets or toilets and urinals, then you could go in either one. Okay. Okay. Uh, Craig, did you want to say something on this? And then and Paul and uh, Xander. Sure, I was I was just going to say um, it, we're in slightly uncharted territories. You know, there's no prescriptive code mm -hmm. for uh, for these things, and so it is a little bit of a guessing game. And I think um, Feingold Alexander is uh, trying to to show you so various options, but within those options, um, you know, whatever is most um, acceptable to the town or the, the to the community is you know the way we can go. And so I think just showing the options of having urinals and toilet stalls in both is one route, but it's not one that we have to take. Okay. Paul, did you uh, wanna? I defer to Alex. Okay. Xander? Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, cause I, I hear the uncharted and consulting codes um, and inspectors and whatnot. Uh, I also just sort of wanted to ask like, have there been any non-binary or genderqueer people involved in looking at these three options? 
Josephine? No, this is just us. You know, we have some um, research that we've done, but we haven't gone through. I mean, the, these these options are from the research that we've done and, and sort of trying to show you um, what we can sort of do with the footprint that we have. And, um, and yeah, yeah, just sort of like starting to touch base on what the process would be and what we what next steps would be and that sort of thing. Craig, did you want to speak to Xander's question? Um, yes, it's it's sort of um, coincidental. I was in a meeting earlier today with uh, clients right up the road from you guys, UMass Amherst, and they have in one of their buildings have done um, gender inclusive toilets. And um, we weren't even meeting about that, but there was a student in the room who identifies as um, being within the LGBTQ community and said how empowering and appreciated it uh, those single stall, you know, group toilets were. Um, so my point being is there is an example right up the road. Um, I believe it's in the student union building um, that perhaps we can schedule a little tour. And those are, are you telling us are, would be the, what, the third option? I'm not sure the exact configuration. I think it's probably um, somewhere in between uh, the medium or the heavy options here. Okay. Um, okay. But I don't, know, I don't know that for sure. They, okay. There may be urinals in there as well. Xander? Yeah, thank you. Like I, um, I think this is an opportunity to, uh, I really appreciate that example, Craig, because I, I think this is an opportunity to engage uh, our full community um, and really also, uh, you know, do the work. And, and I don't I don't know if this is something we need to vote on today, but um, the the outreach community or the outreach committee could even do some of the work of like reaching out to our uh, queer community and like making sure that everyone feels safe within our library. All right, thank you. Uh, Craig, are you, are you, is your hand still up or are you, um, Alex? Yeah, withdrawn. Um, yeah, I just wanna build on what um, Alex is saying. Um, so I, do we have a sense of, uh, when, when do we have to make a decision or some decision and what sort of timeline do we have to reach out to um, the LGBTQ community to ask those questions. Josephine. So we did discuss um, with Craig, you know, um, timeline for this, um, this sort of thing. And we, as you know, we'll be um, submitting SDs very soon. So this is something that can happen um, after. Um, we can sort of just keep plugging away. Um, again, as we noted, the, the um, biggest cost difference is really with option three, um, but I don't think that um, it's, um, you know, an in, in impact so much that, um, you know, we, we need to be too concerned with um, if we keep plugging away with the SD set as it is at the moment, we could potentially, you know, pull out a little alternate if we needed to, um, just to this particular room. And, and, you know, ask for, if we thought we wanted to go this direction, we could, you know, ask for a, a price on that option three, um, sort of keep it like kind of pulled away and separate, I suppose. Um, that's something we could consider uh, doing for the SD submission. But I think this is something that, um, you know, we can begin DDs and, and hopefully start getting some, some feedback um, in, in the same um, time, what we could do on our end is um, have our, our code consultants start looking into, um, you know, calling the plumbing inspector and start making those calls that he needs to as well, so we can get more information as well. So we have time. The answer to the question is we have time to do what Xander and Alex have now referenced. Yes, I, I, I would say that we, it doesn't have to be done before the SD submission. Great. <laughs> All right. That's great. That's great to hear. So, uh, Josephine, just to be clear, is this, uh, are you looking for, uh, what kind of feedback are you looking for from the committee today? So, um, 
we have a couple more images we want to go through with with you on this um, right. just to go through um, some options for the um, toilet stalls themselves just to show okay. you what's out there and um, also you know get your 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 mind start to you know thinking about percolating about like different uh, opportunity or different options for these um, the layouts and the privacy concerns that I know is going to be out there for you with um, with some of these options and and so before we wrap up on this um, just to quickly run through um, I think some of you have already seen these images but um, to the left is basically um, what we were talking about as far as full height partitions um, floor to ceiling um, with maximum privacy and so that sometimes will lead to, of course, the the security concerns. Um, uh, and of course, it's also the priciest of the options um, for, you know, closing off, but it does also give people that, um, you know, the privacy that they might be looking for in that kind of setup. Um, but then you also can go to something that's a little less um, of a concern, perhaps, um, because these partitions here on the right, um, we're calling semi-private. Um, you have a couple of options. The doors are um, stopping short of the floor, so you can see if someone's in there. Um, and the side par partitions in between, they um, you have the option. Um, those can also be... Um, stop short of the floor or go floor to ceiling. Um, that's something that can be decided later as well. Um, we feel like this one maybe is a little bit more of a balance and we're seeing these installed um, in more locations, even in restrooms that aren't gender neutral, we're seeing these installed. And I think it's just because people are looking down the road, they can potentially just change the signs on the door and sort of move forward with, um, you know, a, a gender neutral bathroom down the road and have you know the option of having something that's a little bit more private um and then of course you have your standard partitions that um you know you'll see in a lot of restrooms you see them all the time when you go out right <laughs> um and of course this is just you know the least amount of security concerns but um and least least expensive of course um but I think you're seeing the other type, the semi-private, more often these days. So we just wanted to throw these out there for you guys to, to start thinking about. Okay, Craig. Um, so uh, doubling back on the timing question, so design development goes from August through November. I would say um, it would be ideal if you know, whatever further questions and information um, can be brought up and, and answered. Um, and then a decision be rendered maybe by the end of August, I think would be a good goal. And then that would get it in early enough in DDs that, that it, that it in theory shouldn't have a, a huge impact. Josephine, does that sound like a, an appropriate timing? Yeah, that sounds reasonable. I was thinking the same thing really. And Alex, just to check in, that sounds reasonable from the outreach committee's point of view. Uh, yeah, I, I think so. That gives us that gives us a sense of timing, which is great. Thank you. Great. Okay. Uh, again, Josephine, are you uh, interested in people's reactions now to these private, semi-private? If anyone has any comments or questions, they can feel great. free to ask. Okay, sure. George. Um, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the semi-private stalls also alleviate the need for added uh, ventilation and lighting. Am I correct? Correct. Yes, they don't go all the way. Um, so you, like I like I had said, they could go to the the side partitions could go to the floor, um, but they don't go all the way up, and they're not closed off. So you would need separate ventilation. Or lighting. Other observations or questions? Okay, I see. I see no hands. So, do you have anything else, Josephine, on restrooms? I think that was it on restrooms. Okay. Shall we move on to elevator? That would be good. Okay. Um, so 
what we'll do is just, um, I think we'll take you right to the top floor to show you um, really where the biggest impact, um, well, what we'll, I guess we could start at level one. What we did here was um, we um, understand the concern to have two elevators. So we looked at um, bringing the new elevator all the way to the top floor and eliminating the existing elevator. So um, the existing elevator, if you can see my cursor was right here. Um, so we gained a little bit of square footage in all of the spaces where the existing elevator was. Um, the current elevator stayed the same on all levels. Um, so stayed the same here and again, just removed the footprint of the existing elevator. Um, but if we go to the top level, you'll see <clears throat> the biggest change. We did gain back square footage here in the reading room, which is um, really great for this space. Opens up sight lines as well. Um, but this floor is where it impacts the most um, because um, this new elevator now goes up to this level to make it accessible. So again, existing elevator was here, is now gone. We have the, um, the new stair that we're building here is going up to this level. So this is the footprint of that that you're seeing down here. Um, and, and what we did here was create this corridor, if you will, um, to access the elevator at this level. So what this does, um, you will see it in a couple of different um, places, but what we're gonna show you is just sort of a 3D view outside and what that, um, what that will look like. Um, another thing that it, it doesn't take up um, too much of a footprint, which is great news. Um, what it will do is um, cut through the existing roof here um, at this location. So it will eliminate um, one of the um, dormers, if you will, um, that's within that existing um, roof, if you, if, if, um, if you will, is sort of where the roof and the, and the wall meet. Um, and so with that, I'll take you to the 3D view. And this is just a quick shot of the, of the Revit model um, from Amity Street, um, sort of from the sidewalk. And, and, and this is it right here. And so, <clears throat> you know, we will, of course, be going through Mass Historic, et cetera, to, um, to you know, review all of these um, changes that we're making. Um, but we don't think that this is too much of an impact since it is pushed out so far back um, and it's not going up that high. Um, and we do see the benefit um, of not having to maintain two elevators um, and to service two elevators for the life of the, of the building. So just to be clear, Josephine, as I'm walking up to the library, I'm gonna see this um, basically elevator shaft. Yes. And how is that gonna sit with respect to the roof line of the new, um, of the, the addition? So the roof line of the addition, um, yeah. well, we have a few different um, levels of the addition. Yeah. Um, so, and we can certainly, you know, send over elevations as well um, for you to see that we don't have views, um, you know, in that direction um, for tonight, but um, we do have a couple different roof planes that are actually happening. Um, so it does not, go higher than the existing roof mm -hmm. elevation. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we did, I mean, we did look at it from all angles and don't feel that it's a big Im impact to um, the roof lines mm -hmm. from our initial assessment. Okay, uh, Christine. Since we're um, in the design group, we're talking a lot about the out side look um, and materials. What, uh, Josephine, would, do you think you would cover that with? Because I know we have materials we're looking at on the addition, mm -hmm. but for the part where we see it right now with the old building, 
what would we do to have it blend in? For this area, we most likely will be looking at metal panel. Uh, colored or like? Gray, it most likely will be a gray. It will probably match, it will probably match the metal panel that we're using anywhere else on the building. I want to make sure I understood your response. You mean the, sh the elevator shaft that I'm looking at will be metal. It's not going to be, it's not going to be stone or anything. It's going to be, you're saying it will be metal, like the metal of the roof. Most likely will be metal panel. You know, we haven't really resolved all the materials okay. that we're using yet on the building, but we are looking at metal panel for certain elements. Okay. Well, um, well We'll get back to that, Christine. Sure, yeah. I don't see any other hands, so I just want to um, yeah. ask a second question about, um, this is more expensive to do this. And um, so I assume, but it's worth it because we're worried about maintenance of two elevators, but how much, because I'm, I'm really thinking about, is there any worry about cutting into the roof? Because I know it's slate and old, is that, like worrisome or costly? Well, you know, we're not worried about this option, but it will be more costly up front. Um, but if you look at servicing two elevators for the life of the building, it's one of those, you know, it's, all, it's always a balance of um, what you spend up front versus um, the lifetime. Um, it's sort of like the sustainability um, options we looked at so many times, right? Um, how much, you know, you want to spend up front versus the, you know, 20 years from now or 30 years from now. Um, so, so, you know, that having two elevators can be a big resource drain, you know, on the facility. Um, so, you know, Craig, you might have something else to, to add as far as <laughs> existing and new, but we don't see any, any concerns with, I mean, it's, it's definitely a little bit more work now up front, um, but again, dealing with existing elevator, we understand the concerns of that. Craig. And yes, thank you, Austin. And aside from the cost difference, there's also the added benefit of this plan in that it opens up um, the floor plate um, for some more gracious spaces um, on, on several of the levels. Mm -hmm. So there's, so it's not just, um, so the balance is, you know, more upfront cost, but helps with the layout and lower operating and maintenance um, going forward. George? Um, and also just, just to clarify, the existing elevator uh, in this case would go away. So there would be cost savings from not refurbishing it. But also, if that original elevator was to stay, it would not increase in size. Therefore, it would still not be completely usable as a handicap accessible elevator because it's not up to code size-wise. Am I right? I want to say that is correct, but I would have to look at the dimensions again. But I re I'm, from what I recall, it was not handicap accessible, which would mean you know they would still have to use the new um, elevator. So you are correct, and in fact. Um, refurbishing costs would would be you know a factor as well. Josephine, can you go back to the third level, mm -hmm. please? Oh, right. That, no, no, that that's the level I wanted to see. So, roughly, what is the length of the hallways that that you're showing from the elevator? That kind of L shape hallway. Um, yep. Steve, do you know off the top of your head? I know he's been modeling like crazy, so. <laughs> I I do not, but if you give me a couple minutes to circle back, I will figure that out for you. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, I'm just thinking about it in terms of its accessibility for someone in a in a wheelchair navigating that particular sharp corner. I assume that the hallways will be wide enough to make that possible. Absolutely, yes. Okay. Okay, questions or thoughts about this revised elevator design? Okay, seeing none. 
Um, and again, I'm just going to continue to ask this question, Josephine. So from the point of view of moving forward in schematics and into design development, we are now, our silence is a, a, an endorsement of this elevator plan, Paul. Yeah, I, I endorse one ele elevator. I mean, when we talked to Holyoke, they said one elevator was plenty for them. Yep. And so totally endorse it and getting rid of maintaining two elevators is huge. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to let you know. So coming off the elevator, the length of that hallway before you make the, the right-hand turn will be 16 feet. And then um, to the end of the existing dormer there will be uh, 25, 25 feet long. So it's a long, so 16 feet, it's a long, long hallway. Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I'm just, I'm interested in your view, uh, your sense of this third level. You've got a stair coming up, you've got another stair coming up, got an elevator. It, in, in terms of the, this level, it, uh, uh, it feels a little odd to see these staircases coming up and then the, the whole way down yeah. to, the, to the elevator. Yeah, and honestly, Austin, I think we can actually, um, this was sort of our first pass okay. um, at this approach, at this design. Okay. Um, and I think what we can do is look at this layout a little bit more because we had a couple of, um, you know, corners and turns here that we had previously because of the elevator, the existing elevator. And I think yeah. now that if it's gone, we can do a little rework on this floor and, and even the stair can, we can do a little bit of okay. um, rejiggering on the stair as well um, to make this layout work a little bit smoother, I think. Okay, Steve. Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback off that with our, so the main, the main port, uh, the primary goal of the study was to make sure because of the roof planes, the way they come down was making sure we had enough head height for the stair so that uh, you had enough head clearance as you came up this floor to make sure where it landed. Now that we know that there's a way it can work, we can definitely rejigger, we can probably rejigger the, the, the stair in a way so that you don't feel like you're coming into this uh, kind of, like you're not, you're not coming right up to the landing of the other stair. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, um, it's a complicated, complicated geometry section, sectionally. That was, that was what was the driver here for this initial, um, the, the initial pass of this. Okay. Uh, Alex, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just, I mean, I obviously like the, the maintenance of one elevator versus two, but I also like that the boardroom, which will also be serving as a public meeting room, um, feels a lot more accessible for somebody um, who needs an ADA compliant elevator. Um, and also just wanna comment that our staff area, because right now um, we don't have an accessible staff area and having an elevator that easily leads to the staff area, I think makes for a much more friendly environment to be able to hire staff with accessibility needs. So I. Just want to add that on to the list of things that I appreciate about this change. Yeah, thank you, Alex. And I, I'm just going to say for myself, I'm looking forward to seeing the rejiggering because this just strikes me as not a particularly workable um, and inviting kind of layout. But again, I'm looking forward to the rejiggering. Steve, did you want to say something else? No, forgive me. I forgot to lower my hand. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. All right, so we are gonna go forward with the one elevator approach. Uh, appreciate greatly the work that you've done to uh, show us the way this is uh, likely gonna play out on each level. Uh, there are no other questions about the elevators. You, another item listed was exterior materials. You have more for us on exterior materials? I believe the the, um, we don't have anything for tonight for exterior materials. Okay. Um, I think that okay. was um, Friday's discussion. Yeah, that was, a, that was, so to speak, a leftover. Okay. Yeah, so um, what we, I discussed with Feingold Alexander is they'll present that information at the uh, design subcommittee on Friday. Great. Um, but they might have one more thing, which okay. uh, is the, uh, the a dedicated room for the Civil War tablets. 
Joseph. Ah, uh, yes. You thank could, you. Could you guys show them that? Let's go back down to the ground floor. <laughs> um, so yes, we did um, sneak in the Civil War tablet room here in exhibit space. Um, so what we did was we split um, this area into two spaces instead of one. Um, and <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and so the Civil War tablets you'll see here on the left. And we have a couple of doors accessing it, which of course we can, um, you know, get into further how it's going to be used and how you want circulation in there. Um, but we have um, the special collections um, workroom here. Sorry, the text I think is wrong. Um, this was the, the workroom and this was the exhibit room. Um, Roughly, Josephine, what are the dimensions of the proposed, I can't see, it says 540 square feet? Is that what it says? Yes. Yeah, the Civil War tablet exhibits is 545 square feet. And in calculating that dimension, you took into account the dimensions and the number of the tablets themselves? We used a square footage number that was given to us. Okay. Um, and so um, I think there is some discussion on where they will go and how they will be laid out, um, mm -hmm. whether it's on the walls or not. Um, so um, that could be a further discussion um, that, you know, that um, is had. And if we need to adjust some numbers, we can. And then, Paul, before I call on you, I just want Sharon to... Uh, this is a reduction in the special collections uh, area. Uh, what is the, Yes. what Sharon, um, do you have to say about that? Yeah, so my only concern, so I love this, My but my only concern is it, it does mean a, a loss of space for, you know, climate controlled storage space, um, which is one of the reasons that we are, um, expanding special collections was for that purpose. Um, so it, it's just something to keep in mind as, as we're moving forward. Okay. Paul? Yeah, I, I appreciate your thoughtfulness in thinking about this. Um, and I'd you know, be interested to know from the uh, civil, I, I know you're meeting with the civil war tablets group. So in terms of uh, how you know if they're if they're the wall space works or if they think they want them on walls to begin with whatever i mean one thing i would think would be beneficial since that's a very public space because of the meeting room and everything is if that interior wall if that could be if there could be some glass or something or people could look in and see them after hours where they could be lit and you know even if there's not access available people could peer in and see oh look at these things so just a thought Josephine was nodding. So that's I a good point. Yep, we I think we had sort of initial discussions with Sharon on that, um, and it sort of depends on what route um, you want to take um, with display, okay. and um, and we always it, depending on how you want the views in, um, we could potentially, of course, this could be could, this could have more glass, or that could be a storage wall where some of the ex existing exterior masonry walls. Um, get punched so that way you can see in more um, but I think ultimately it's going to depend on how um, you folks want to display them and um, the amount of area that we have yeah I think if I followed your cursor I don't think it's the interior wall separating special collections from the civil war tablets that Paul was referencing but rather that right. that's it okay great right. Sharon right. yeah so my question is um does it, and I, I can't see the square footage figure, so maybe that's the answer to the question, but I thought it made sense for the special collections exhibit space to be next to the Civil War tablets uh, room. And, and so I thought you were gonna switch the uh, exhibit space with the workroom. Um, is it a square footage issue? We're pretty close to square footage. Um, exhibits is in the high 600s, and um, the workroom is 
is close to 600. So it's pretty close. So we could do a swap out on those two if you wanted to. I would do a swap out. And here's, and again, you guys are going to meet with the Civil War tablets folks. But what I was thinking was it, whether it's one big room or, or two separate rooms, there's a benefit to being able to use that space after hours because um, it could all really work quite beautifully together. So I think... It, I, I, as much as I think my special collection staff would be sad to see the workroom move across the hallway, I think there are more benefits to the Civil War tablets being next to the exhibit space. George, you had your hand up. Um, yeah, that, that was my only concern about swapping them was um, how would the special collection staff provide oversight for the reading room? if it was across the hall from all of their other operations. That's my only concern there. Okay. Other thoughts, observations about the proposed um, room for the Civil War tablets? Okay, pending further consultation. Thank you for this uh, proposal. Thank you. Thanks very much for this proposal. Okay, anything else from FAA? I think the last thing we were just gonna quickly touch base on um, to not take up too much more of your sure. time, but absolutely. Um, let me go to the last um, image. We just wanted to show the rendering again and just quickly touch base on a point that was brought up um, just about existing and, and, and new and the new edition and how it ties into the existing. Um, I know you folks had done a few library tours um, in the past week or so, and um, and hopefully that was really beneficial and you got to pull away some some you know um, some interesting ideas, um, and and so I think someone had mentioned Holyoke and of course you know that is a project that we reference a lot, but um, what we're sort of doing with um, with Jones Library is very similar in the sense that we have a lot of existing walls, um, beautiful existing masonry walls, and we're adding on to the rear of the building and we will introduce, um, you know, these spaces that are seeing these old walls as they are. Um, and it's one of the most fun parts of adding on to an existing building is bringing the outside in. Um, and so we sort of draw that line and sort of start new with the new addition and we sometimes will carry elements from the old building across like lines or patterns or you know things of that nature um but we do sort of draw that line and and um have a clear difference of where the new is um but i think that was just a question that had popped up well i want to pursue it a little bit because what i noticed in holyoke was in the old section of the library you had wonderful woodwork, carvings, really interesting detail. That stopped. Then you went into the new part of the building. And the only thing that referenced the old building, at least to my eye, and again, others might have seen other things, was the uh, exterior wall that was now an interior wall. So my question is, is it possible to do something in the new part of the building that carries some of the architectural detail signature aesthetic of the interior design of the old building. Uh, because I didn't see that at all in Holyoke. I mean, it felt that these, uh, they were kind of two buildings that were just kind of put together and that there was nothing that kind of unified them architecturally other than the uh, couple places where the exterior wall showed. So I wasn't talking particularly about the exterior wall because I know that you intended to do that. I was talking about the kind of, is there any, I mean, you can't, you know, replicate the detail of that, you know, 1900s building in Holyoke in quite the way it was done, but is there any way of uh, tying some, some of it together a little bit more? Yeah, um, there's, you know, a couple of different reasons why we do um, typically go that direction, but yep. um, sometimes it's not as easy to be read, um, but we do, um, we do always, you know, try to look at 
um, you know, important lines. We try to carry, you know, different elevations, um, like I mentioned, patterns. Um, but we do try to um, also because of some, you know, when we're adding on to these historic buildings, um, we do also have the issue of not matching exactly what is there um, through Mass Historic, et cetera. They don't, they like to see the difference um, of where, you know, news starts. Um, and so uh, we do try to do certain things, but we don't match, you know, certain like uh, level of detail of historic woodwork, for instance. Um, yeah, well, I will continue to raise this question because my mm -hmm. my issue isn't matching exactly. My issue is doing something that produces a little more of a sense that these buildings have some greater relationship to each other. But uh, Paul and then correct, correct, Paul. Yeah, so I, I really love the outside. It would Austin reference the outside exterior as the interior. And I think that really gives it, it recognizes the old building. I think that it looks really cool. It makes it, it differentiates the building somewhat. Um, I do know in Holyoke, they talked about the um, roof connection between the old and new as being the major problem area and that you had to pee, you know, that's where they had water infiltration and making that work was really important. So I know that would be on your radar screen, but um, yeah, so, so I just want to applaud your in incorporation of this and, and having it be up close and personal like it looks like on the stairwell is kind of cool because that's yeah. what they did in Holyoke and it was neat to see. Thank you, Paul. Craig and then Anika. Craig, you're muted. Thank you, Austin. Um, so uh, perhaps this is something we can dig into in a little more depth yeah. in um, the design subcommittee, but um, you know, there are, there are challenges to um, adding in details. You know, the craftsmanship is just not there nowadays compared to, you know, 100 years ago. Um, but as um, Josephine was uh, alluding to, carrying important lines, uh, you know, either, either horizontal lines or vertical um, uh, proportions into elements in the new building, you know, there, there's some potential maybe for that. But I think I think it's a it's a it would be a good thought exercise and maybe um, something that we can dig into a little bit more with the design team. With while at the same time keeping that um, that separation, not not making the old building uh, the new addition look you know you know falsely look like uh, an older building. But I, I think there's some some opportunity for more discussion. Okay, thank you, Anika. Yes, I just wanted to add that I love this section as well. I, I love anything that makes you feel like you're outdoors, especially with, you know, New England uh, climate. You know, I'd imagine it looks so beautiful in the winter all year, um, the winter time as well. And um, I just wanted to add a thank you for a very uh, generous proposed uh, space for the Civil War tablets. Great. Thank you, Anika. Okay, any other comments? FAA. I think that covers our portion. Okay, no other questions or comments. We want to uh, thank you again for the work that you're doing, for the progress that you're making. We can see this progress now uh, kind of clearly almost meeting by meeting as you're taking on some of these issues and it's it's really wonderful to, wonderful to see. Thank you. Craig, I think we're back to you. Yes, thank you, Austin. Um, so let's see. Um, so Josephine and Steve, uh, I would say, unless the uh, building committee has more that they want to ask or, or involve you in, I, I would say thank you for coming this evening. Thanks. But uh, perhaps you can make your exit. Thank you very if much. You want. It's good seeing everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, OK, so uh, back to the OPM report. So. Um, project schedule. I'll show my share my screen. Let me get it tidied up a little bit here. Close that. Open that. There we go. So here's our schedule. I did not, unfortunately, I did not have time to move that little red line over. 
but you can imagine it here mm -hmm. closer to the end of June. Uh, we're still in schematic design, but we are approaching the end portion, which um, will involve some cost estimates, um, review and reconciliation of those cost estimates, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. And then as far as the temporary location, we're still solidly in that uh, collecting public input phase, portion of the phase. Um, when it comes to the construction estimates, uh, to give you know, the, the building committee and, and the public a little recap, what my office recommends is actually um, two cost estimates um, for each phase. So one cost estimate will be provided by the design team. They've uh, engaged Fennessy um, Consulting to provide their cost estimate. That's part of their design package. Um, we recommend that the town have their own independent cost estimator look at the, um, the same packages and uh, provide their own cost estimate. And then what we do is we go through a process of reconciliation where we see what the differences are and get the two cost estimating professionals to come to uh, an agreement. Uh, the function of this is um, with, with anything talking about making predictions of the future, uh, it is, it's notoriously difficult to do that accurately. So having two different professionals looking with two separate sets of eyes um, and then reconciling them will give you a more reliable um, anticipated cost and will help you make decisions uh, uh, with, with better information. Now there is a, a cost to that. We did include in the budget um, $40,000 for that effort. We have, let's see, we, we on, on behalf of the town, my office solicited um, three cost estimating firms. Uh, we had uh, PMNC, all, all very you know well-known, very experienced and reputable firms. PMNC came back with a cost estimate um, A.M. Fogarty was not available, uh, and Ryder Levitt Bucknall um, came back with a cost estimate. The out of the two we received, the lowest um, cost is uh, Ryder Levitt Bucknell or RLB at thirty-four thousand five hundred. So it comes in nicely uh, within the budget we had assigned. That would be for three cost estimating exercises: one at the end of schematic design, one at the end of design development and one at the 75% uh, construction document phase. And those align with the, what the design team and their cost system area are doing. So um, we talked about this a little bit um, offline uh, about you know, who, who should best approve that. Um, we are getting to the point July 1st is when the design documents will be available. And then both sets of cost estimators will have the two just two weeks to uh, give us their numbers and uh, then we'll start reconciling. So prior to that July 1st, um, I it would be our recommendation that the town queue up their cost estimator of choice, which I think would be um, our LB. Um, so that is sort of my update for both <laughs> schedule and budget. Um, are there any questions about that or? Well, I'm eager to hear from Sean and Paul about this second cost, this idea of the second cost estimation. Sean? Yeah, I, I, I think it's critical that we get these cost estimates at the uh, the phases that Craig recommended because it's this is really all we have in order to make adjustments or to kind of see if we're on track or getting off track. Um, so I, I think, you know, I would lean towards what Craig recommended. Um, I don't know if we're going to, Craig, I don't know if the expectation was that this committee will sort of vote to move forward with those, or if you're looking for a vote or just sort of nodding heads. Um, but I think it makes sense to move forward with the cost estimates. Yeah, I would assume that this is really a question of the committee's endorsement and support, but that this decision is really, it's a, a town decision. But uh, does anybody have any thoughts about the second cost estimation? Okay, hearing none. Paul, did you want to say anything about it? No, I agree. I think you know, this is the most critical time in terms of impacting the cost of this project and knowing more accurately what the costs are and what the driving forces are in the cost and what the pieces are that can move around is really important for us. So yeah, I agree. If, if there's no objection by the committee, we can move forward on that. 
Great. And Austin, maybe just kind of quickly follow up. Sure. Um, our last, Craig, maybe you know this, you may not because you weren't with us from the beginning, but the last cost estimate we, um, cost estimate that we had was based on a design from, I think, 2021, right, or earlier. Um, so it's been some quite some time since we actually mm -hmm. had a cost estimate on the latest um, design. Is that, is that correct? Yes. So the most recent information we've received was actually just a retooling of right. uh, the cost estimate. So it's, it was brought up to modern market understanding, but it is, like you said, of the old design. So uh, we will be getting kind of a fresh look at the end of the schematic design phase. Okay. Thank you. Alex? Thanks. Um, for relative to the bathroom, I heard Josephine say that we could treat that as an alternate. So is that something that would be included in this first cost estimate and we would have both the independent do an alternate as well? Yes, exactly. Okay. So, and that's Thanks. something that we, we have included in the scope of, of services is a couple add or deduct alternates for that exact reason. So we can try out different combinations uh, without going too crazy. We only want to do a couple of them, but um, to see what the cost impact would be for say these big moves. Great, okay. I think we're all on board and appreciate the recommendation and the endorsement from the town. Craig. Um, next item on the agenda, um, sorry, was some information about the uh, about Eversource. So last time we met, we spoke about the memorandum of understanding and talked about the program and availability. And uh, I think there were two questions. One was what happens if the town signs that memorandum of understanding, but then for other for future reasons unknown to us now, decides to back out. Um, and um, I saw I asked that question of Eversource, and they gave a very clear answer that it is a non-binding memorandum of understanding, and so there would be right. no negative consequences, uh, aside from just losing out on the opportunity to yeah, yeah. get those rebates. Uh, and then the second one was how did you know there are three entities, three stakeholders, the you know the board of trustees, the town and the library building committee and uh, Eversource clarified or, or reiterated that the, the entity that is paying the bill is the entity that they consider the customer. And so I believe that is the, well, I, I won't guess, but. <laughs> Sharon, I believe that's the trustees. Are you paying the bill? Yeah, for? we're okay. the one with the meter. Unless you guys want to take that on, that'd be great. <laughs> hey, I, I think you volunteered in an email, so, <laughs> so take it. Correct. So this, this will come to the Board of Trustees uh, of, the, of the library for its review and decision. Okay, uh, Craig, anything else? Interim location? Um, nothing, no report on that aside from that we're still okay. in the collecting uh, information phase. I wanna ask you a question which, um, uh, how is Feingold Alexander doing? Are you finding them, um, well, how are they doing? I'm very happy with their performance. Um, they, they're responsive, they are, uh, they, they are very experienced. They, um, I've been very pleased with the product and, um, and the process. And your primary contact with FAA is? Um, so <laughs> there are multiple. So the, uh, I, any, any communication I have is always with uh, Alan Ancelone, yeah. uh, who wasn't able to attend today. Yeah, that's fine. On Friday, uh, Josephine and Steve. And then obviously, okay. you know, Tony is involved. Jim Alexander is involved somewhat. As needed. Um, yes, you got it. Okay. All right. Any questions for, any other questions for Colliers? Other than, oh, yeah, Xander. Sorry, I just wanted to ask on the temporary building, um, I just trying to figure out how we do outreach around that and what services and whatever. Um, it's a little tricky until we have an idea of where that might be. And so I'm just curious, timeline on that and how it uh, coincides with sort of the projection of like August as the end of outreach. Certainly, let me um, pull up that um, schedule again. It's always nice to have a graphic. All right, so. Imagine that red line shifted over still in June, but towards the end, we are 
say in the first half of this public input phase, um, where simultaneously um, you could be collecting information, I guess, preferences or, or thoughts about what would be ideal or most convenient for people or preferred. Um, we're assuming that there's gonna be multiple locations that the um, existing two branches will continue to function, uh, but then there'll also be uh, you know, maybe a, a location here in town that will be for administrative, um, a location here in town that's for another function. Um, so um, only by the end of August is when um, we recommend start um, signing, <laughs> signing the contracts and getting those uh, lined up. So sorry, it's not a ton of new information. Does that sort of answer your question? Uh, yes, in that we're going to have to figure it out. So yeah. I appreciate that. And I don't imagine, unless Sharon or Paul want to tell me that, that they're going to be like, we're going to be doing site selection. There are four sites. We're going to choose one. I don't imagine that's what we're going to be doing, right? We're going to have a site and that's, is that, is that right? That, that, that's what I think. Um, yeah, our, our options are kind of going to be limited. And, and so regarding the outreach committee and, and, and public input, I'm, I'm not sure the question should be, uh, where should it be located? I think it should be more about the services. What kinds of services do you want to see provided during those two years that we're located in different spots? Yeah. But if I, if I understood what Craig just said, it's not going to be one site. We're going to have to figure out which services go where because things are going to. Is that right, Craig? So that's not that's not a Craig. That's not a Craig. Uh, I'm sorry, Craig. I would never stop you from responding. That's a Sharon Sherry answer. Craig is not responsible for the allocation of library services unless he's been doing something on the sly. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that the spaces are going to dictate what goes where, you know, we need X amount of square feet for adult circulation, for example. And I don't think we're gonna have a lot of choices as to where that will go, as opposed to office space, which is, you know, a different beast. So I, uh, yeah. As you think about those things, I think uh, the question is, you, you're gonna wanna hear from uh, the public about what their thoughts or concerns are so that you can respond in so far as it is possible to what those concerns are about service. The other reason for doing public outreach about this is to inform the public. So we'll gather what, the, but you'll also be telling people in advance that this is what the plan is and they can react to that plan. Okay, uh, Xander, does that, uh, your hand is still up, are you? Okay. Sorry, I just left it up, but no, yes, not a... I, I got that. We can oh. inform people. Sharon's got it. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay, so we've got two subcommittee reports, and then I'm going to ask Sean to do the financial um, update. So a subcommittee report from the design subcommittee, whose next meeting is the uh, 24th of June. There is a question about the time of that meeting. So... Is it at nine or is it at 10? What has it been posted for? Angie? It's been posted for 10. Christine? So our meetings are usually at nine, um, but in the coordination of determining the agenda, um, Sharon had put it at 10. Uh, and I also just want to check in with Craig if that's okay with him and if that's what FAA is expecting. Craig? So that time works for me. Um, and FAA, I believe, was invited via Angie's, uh, Angela's um, most recent invitation. So I think 10 o'clock is what they're planning on as well. Okay, right. Christine. So the meeting is at 10 o'clock on Friday. 
Uh, the design subcommittee continues to sort of do the preliminary work, um, questions to the designer to sort of get them to dive deeper and get information ready to bring to this larger committee. Um, so a lot of things that we saw today, we had seen parts of on the, on the design group. So the next thing that's coming up on Friday is we're going to dive deeper into this new room for the Civil War tablets and the Civil War Tablet Committee will have representatives there. Um, and the other thing we'll be talking more about is the exterior materials. Uh, we saw some more options at our last meeting, but they're gonna, you know, they can't do cost, cost estimates at this point, but they're gonna come back with more information to help us kind of decide um, what we think are better options regarding what ones are more expensive or less or more expensive or less expensive. So that's what will be on Friday. The other thing on Friday is we're gonna be doing round three um, of evaluating and going through all the public comments that the outreach committee's working really hard to get. Uh, we've got, we're actually gonna bring you round two tonight, today, right now, um, but round three we'll be going over, which will complete all the comments that were collected as of like May 16th. Um, but I do have a question for Craig. Craig, uh, will we be seeing any other comments from since that period that have to do, that are time sensitive to the schematic design? I will check on that. Short answer is I don't know. I haven't had a moment to check <laughs> yet, uh, but I will do that, um, okay. let's say sometime tomorrow. And you'll somehow either add them into the spreadsheet or, okay, great. So we'll watch for those and anyone on the design subcommittee be aware that you may get another round of additional uh, comments that, because we just want to get those done because we are racing towards the end of schematic design. So with that, um, I was going to ask, uh, I don't know, Craig or Sharon, if you can pull up the current spreadsheet that we're working on. Um, and as it comes up, I just want to um, comment to people that there's, um, we're only working on a second round, a second section in this, which I do believe is orange. When it comes up, we'll see. And Sharon had added six additional ones that were new um, that are highlighted in yellow. Um, so, Sharon, I don't know if you want to do this or I can do this, but it's probably better if you do this. But overall, when we looked at these comments, they were either already being addressed or have been addressed or the designer already is aware of, of the suggestion or comment or concern and are addressing it. And you'll see that in the spreadsheet. Um, Craig, are you pulling it up? Or I don't know who has it. I'm searching for the file. Okay, let me, I can, I have it, I have it right here. So let me share my screen. All right, great. So there's two columns. The first two columns um, that we'll point out here um, are sort of like, it's the white one, column D and E are the ones that we're not gonna go over with you now because we're saying we've already gone through them and they're already being addressed and the designer already knows and we agree and, Great idea, great comment, thank you so much. Um, but then we have a yellow action, maybe. And um, actually, so if you roll, did you change? Okay, there we go. So you see in column A, there's orange and these are the ones we're addressing. Six additional ones got added in. Those are column B in the yellow. And uh, we're going, to, we're already committee, we're good with D and E. Um, we're looking at F, but Sharon, I suggest we ignore any that are tabled for a future. Um, and just for the sake of time, just talk about any of the comments that weren't ones that were tabled or and the very few that are in the G read that were disagreed. Um, and you can explain why. Thank you, Chris. That was that was super helpful. Okay, so I'm I we're looking at the maybes. I'm in column F, and I'm looking for things. Uh, so that brings me to first off, comment number seventy four. Active areas. We the committee was un, unclear what that meant. Um, that is design of the interior. I don't know if Alex the Fave knows anything more about that. 
Yeah, I I would say that Craig uh, hit the nail on the head during design meeting when he said that it was, uh, you know, quiet places for reading and active places. Uh, for example, the children's room, you know, if there's an area where kids can be active or in adult spaces where kids, people can be communicative and um, the entire library is not a place to be quiet. Yes, I highly agree to that. Um, so can I change that to agree? I, I think what I think what is really understood is that this is already contemplated in the design. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I keep going. Unclear meaning interior devices or exterior charging stations. Oh, that's a really good clarification. Both. Alex, do you know more? I don't on that one. It's a really good question. Um, I keep all of the notes, but I generally type them in exactly as they're written. So um, I don't know which it is. Um, yeah, but, sorry. but we we can. I mean, right? We're going to have charging stations. You're going to have some facility for charging on the inside, right? That, that's part of the des the design. Will be part of the design. So the question is: Is there contemplation of having electric vehicle charging stations associated with what? With the the CVS lot, the lot across the street. I mean, what uh, what what could it be? Uh, so what I understand, and Craig, you can um, tell me if I'm wrong, but I thought that the remaining parking spaces on the library site were all going to be handicapped accessible. Um, I don't think there are a lot of, of spaces, but the committee, we have not talked about maybe some of them should be handicapped parking spaces and some of them should be EV stations. Uh, well, there's a question, I guess, for Paul. I mean, is there a townwide plan for EV stations or is it just going to be, you know, the library puts them up and rent puts them up and somebody else puts them up? Um, we don't have a plan. We're developing that with Stephanie Ciccarello, but that's not finalized yet. But we are looking at the strategy going forward. Right now, we're very opportunistic. When there's funding available, we try to put them in key places. So I think that the question about the EV charging stations should be, postponed until we have a little bit of sense of what the town's sense of things is. And, and I would just add to that I see that I put the category as furnishing and equipment, which makes me think in the moment when it was yeah. typed up that I did think it was internal. Otherwise, I would have put design of grounds. <laughs> OK. Uh, and, and sorry. To your question, Sherry, uh, Sharon, I'm flipping through the most recent design set trying to see if the parking spaces on the site are just for staff or just for handicapped or, or and I, I'm not finding that answer at the moment. Yep. Yeah, I think uh, in theory, we had just talked about, we just kind of came to this verbal agreement that it would just be handicapped parking. Okay, we'll move on uh, to comment 116, local right. hero wall to be discussed, potential for interior and or exterior. Does that mean to be discussed now or later? Well, does it need to be discussed at this point in terms of the schematic design? I would, I would say um, if there's a strong desire either to, to have um, Feingold Alexander sort of put it into their minds and start thinking about where that might exist, um, if, you know, again, if, it's, if that's something that everyone finds appealing, we can put it in the category of fine gold, Alexander, please look into it. Um, Could you say a word about what uh, what makes someone a local hero? Uh, totally subjective. Um, the only thing uh, that I'm familiar with is uh, from a, a school near where I live, and they have sort of a, a military um, military um, individuals over time. So they have like a wall, it's actually a big display case and they have all the um, individuals who served in various um, conflicts over the years um, displayed. And so I guess that would be their interpretation of a local hero's wall. 
But I mean, I think we would have, have a different one. Yeah, we'd have to talk about what it means. Uh, wasn't there a local heroes wall in Holyoke? Did I not see that? I don't maybe, recall one. Okay, maybe it was the donors wall, but um, I, 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 what, what are people's thoughts about local heroes and who would count? How would we decide? I'm terrified at the thought. It would mean a whole nother committee. Um, and that's not what scares me. Just the, the thought of, of people trying to define who is a hero. Right. Of course, the local heroes war could be called something else. I mean, the term hero is kind of loaded in a variety of ways. Alex? Yeah, I think, I mean, if, if anything, my inclination would be not some sort of I don't know what this means, but it wouldn't be that it was like a permanent plaque, but maybe there's going to be a lot of spaces for, I think, gallery exhibit type things. And I don't know if this can be put off for a later discussion as something contemplated in, in that way, rather than something permanently part of the building plaque wise. Does any, yeah, Xander. You know, I have found in my short time in Amherst that we need more stuff to argue over. Um, so if we could somehow make this the pinnacle of the library, I'm totally kidding. I, I really want to just second what Alex just said about this being uh, a temporary thing or something that librarians can handle if they feel that it fits into the new building, but not something that the building committee should be uh, dealing with. Does anybody have anything else they want to say about the local hero wall? Okay, let us, let's move beyond local heroes. Uh, free lockers outside for folks who need them. Uh, maybe for holds pickup, design team requested to advise of any known examples. Uh, I, I know that there are... Um, there are libraries who are installing lockers. Um, not only uh, lockers could be for holds, for example, so it wouldn't necessarily be for any one person. Uh, it would be something where somebody could come basically after hours is what it's for. Um, I don't know if Craig has other thoughts. Uh, Xander, are your, is your hand still up on this one? Okay, not hearing from Xander. Nika? Um, yeah, so where that, that sounds um, very convenient, and this just might be my city life antenna going up around the security issues around lockers. Alex? So I actually took this feedback, which I think was at the May 1 event, if I'm not mistaken, and it was under the social work section of us collecting information. And it was referencing other libraries and other cities that have had partnerships with towns or crests or whatever in terms of um, having locker spaces for people who are experiencing homelessness. Paul? Yeah, so, so is this for lockers for a general use or for people to pick up books? I wasn't clear on that. So if it's to pick up books like Amazon does, I think that's a great service because then you can just go and put in your code and get your book. But if it's for other services, social, more social service things, I think we'd want to think about that as a town as opposed to saying build it into the fabric of this building. The comment says free lockers outside for people who need them. I don't think it's about books okay it, it, it the way it reads it's i'm a homeless person i need some place to store some things i see that's okay. the way I re, that's the way i read it okay uh so other thoughts about the that paul suggests that we need to think about it if we're going to think about it at all from the point of view of the town sean I guess, is it a structural question? Is this something that the building has to be designed a certain way to accommodate? Or is this something that could be, I guess to the points other people made, is this actually a building committee issue or is this a, a question that could be answered after if we wanted to do it? Yep, Alex? I'm seconding, yes, I agree, John. This is something that probably can be dealt with later. Okay, thank you. 
ceiling fans. Cold. Ceiling fans. So design team to consider. I don't. Later. Is that what? What the design committee meant? Christine, what did the design committee mean about this? Um, I think it was. I think we were thinking it should go to the designers, but we were wobbling because there was some pushback. Do we even need fans? And is it more of a um, HVAC system right. design thing? Could right. fans goof it up? Uh, George? Yeah, I was just going to say the exact same thing, Christine. Did I think it's part of a bigger conversation when it comes to design development of the HVAC system itself? Great. Okay, let's keep moving. So I would move it, like maybe rewrite it, Craig, a little bit, like, and then put it back into the green or. You want it in green? I think what well, was just suggested. We, it's for HVAC. Like, I don't see this is where we got in the, like, I, is it up to us to decide whether or not to put ceiling fans? I don't even know if the designers have gotten into that kind of granular detail at this point we could table it for later there you go we're good we're, we're, we're good good okay right. so that's the same thing with the north and west facing windows smaller and triple glazed yes okay oops i lost it okay scanner and slides table for technology discussion Oh, leave it alone. Okay, table, table, Keep going. table, table, I, table. Sorry. Can I pop back on, on 137? 137. Um, which is in the agree column. Yeah. yeah. So again, that's drain and stormwater collection listed as a sustainability consideration. So I believe the request was actually like, if you look at the current center, it's a net zero stormwater collection system. So, I just want to make sure people are clear that I think that also goes in the category of part of the conversation with Feingold around what the sustainability of the building looks like. It's not just that we're going to have a code regulated storm collection system. Okay. Okay. So Sharon, I think that, uh, yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Thank you. Down. Oh, is that all of it? We're table, not, yeah. Table, table. Intent of comment is not clear. That was Ex like the other one. Exterior design discussions are ongoing. Should I just leave that alone? Yes. Okay. Tabling, table, table, table. Yep, that's it. So then it's okay. just a few red ones, a few disagrees. Uh, so we have, oh, teens, fewer rules. I kind of thought I was actually just... roll down to your yellow. Yeah, you're, that's, you're oh, start. sorry. We've already done that one. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. No, it's confusing. Sorry. <laughs> Keep the Kinsey Garden. So that's that ship has sailed. Uh, indoor plantings, uh, we're disagreeing to that uh, just, you know, because there's a cost associated with that. Uh, hold on one second. Alex, is your hand up or is it left? Thank you. Okay, Sharon. Okay. And I think George had talked about it's the maintenance. It's not just that plants cost money. It, it's that there are a lot of responsibility to keep. Yeah, them. yeah. And allergies, I think, there, and like worrying about people with leaves, just so the public knows. Okay. Uh, the greenest buildings are those already built. We disagree. Uh, disagree on a fish tank uh, and the mini fridge. Although, uh, you know, so the fish tank was a disagree just because you got to keep the fishy alive. Um, and the mini fridge, so that uh, that's, that's a possibility. Um, and I almost feel like the teens could, should decide and that's something that could be purchased later. Great. Okay. Um, hold on one second. I see Alex's yep. hand. 
Yeah, I was just going to say, can we just move that to the disagree to the maybe and then make that part of team discussion about what they want? I think this is about the building again, like it's not a mate, like that's, that would be a library decision later where right, got it. this is. A... Yeah. Thank you. Uh, teens, no tech space in the library elsewhere in town. So I oh, was a typo. It's no teen space. <laughs> I fixed it, but it was a typo. Oh, it oh, was so... somebody saying don't have a teen space in the library. Oh, so okay. again, we, that's, we, we disagree. Yeah. yeah. Disagree. Plants inside like Pelham. And that's it. Okay. So any other comments, reactions to these uh uh, these comments from the public uh, before we go forward. Sean. Yeah, uh, I apologize if this was already said. Um, Craig, will these things all be built into that schematic design or some of them too detailed to be part of schematic design um, so that when we do get that cost estimate, you know, some of these things will be factored in, at least the ones that we agreed to? So there may be, a, in, in reality, I don't think anything that we give to Feingold Alexander this week will make it into the schematic design. Um, so we had, and I had prioritized all the things uh, in the last go round around one, all the things that I thought needed to be a decision for schematic design. So those, those have all been, um, turned over to Feingold Alexander a couple of weeks ago. So short answer, no, I don't think any of this will make it a schematic design, but I don't think any of it needs to be in schematic. So design. there's nothing here. That's a, a, such a large cost that it, it should be factored in at this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anything else on the public comments? All right. Just that, um, so the public knows, the comments that were tabled, they were tabled into subgroups such as landscaping, furnishings, and technology equipment, and they'll be addressed again later. And it was so, about 100 comments. So I just wanna give you a heads up. It's uh, coming on 10 past six, we're about eight past six, and I would love to be done by 6.30. So, um, I wonder if we can just keep that in mind and we've got miles to go before we sleep. Alex. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on Sean's comment because I think one of the things in there was flipping the Burnett Art Gallery in the bathrooms. I don't know whether those are equivalent enough space, but just putting out there in terms of cost estimates and it, I didn't know where that landed. So nobody needs to answer, just putting it out there. Okay. Uh, Alex, do you have a brief report from the outreach committee? <laughs> brief being the operative word, I do. Um, so we met on June 8th. Um, uh, I'm sorry, we did not meet on June 8th. We met on whatever day it was, last week. Um, as of June 18th, we have uh, 1,781 comments, 494 unique. I still have more to enter. Um, we have, um, people are loving having the renderings. That's been huge in terms of just actually having like decisions to make where people feel like there's a choice. So that's really been great to have. Um, the current right now is 47% for all slate, 37% for uh, the brick slate, 16% uh, for all brick and a resounding zero for metal. <laughs> And, and very active no on metal. <laughs> That's the, uh, we, we call that the Bockelman wing, so. <laughs> Resounding no. And I just wanna remind people on the public comments that I know that Craig is prioritizing for the design committee, but because we have these renderings on the exterior and you're gonna be meeting on that Friday, that there are a lot of comments um, that you can look at without Great. Craig sending them to you. Um, and just quickly, so people know what they're looking at, there are there are four they're labeled exterior options with the four choices and they have totals so if somebody said something like uh, i love that the brick color is matching the stone and my favorite is you know brick over slate like the comment will be there but they'll be in the total so the totals are the totals even if people have made separate comments so just people know that um we created some uh well uh, in the outreach committee, uh, Anika is going to be leading the charge around the Civil War tablets and any community outreach around that. Um, Alex Vander is going to be leading the outreach around temporary locations. Um, what we didn't talk about in that meeting, but has also just happened, is um, 
Cecilia and Matt, two um, of library staff, are going to be um, working internally to make sure that all of the staff comments relative to um, schematic design. And as we go throughout the process, they're going to sort of lead collecting that information, um, which is that subset that we have in the public outreach um, so that that's being collected, which is great. Um, we had a great event, Village Park this Friday. Anybody who could attend, we're going to Rolling Green, again with press in the town between 4.30 and 6.30. We have a community forum scheduled for July 6th at 7 p.m. to again, review the latest set of schematics with the public, collect feedback, and then give it back to uh, design and this committee. Um, and then also just a uh, heads up um, that the newsletter, um, is gonna be published one more time and then it's gonna go on a hiatus for three weeks. Um, people can continue to give comments and feedback and they'll get entered, but there's gonna be a little three week break there. Um, and I think the last thing is just that um, the outreach committee has been reaching out to the Strong House, to the Public Shade Tree Commission, to the Historic Commission, just in terms of making sure that they're in the loop and any questions that they have that right. is being brought up. So if there's any other committees or groups that you think we need to be reaching out to, feel free to pass it along and we'll make sure we're making that connection. Thank you, Alex. Any questions for the outreach committee? Christine. Yeah, Alex, um, great job. Could you tell me the number again of the total um, unique uh, questions that you have? You said 400. 494 unique, but I can tell you that things haven't been updated since 618. So there's more than that, that number will change <laughs> after tomorrow. <laughs> Great. So, so tomorrow you're trying to update that list. I'm asking for Craig, who's somewhere there. He's supposed to go through them to make any that are sensitive sir, uh, for SD so that he can bring them, send them to us for Friday. Do you think that will work? Yeah, that, that should be no problem. Great. Great. Thank you. Okay. Great thanks to the outreach committee for the wonderful work it is doing. Let's hear some wonderful news about our financial update. So we have an invoice. Um, <laughs> I'll start with that. Maybe we'll get that out of the way. Um, so we do have the May invoice. I'll share my screen real quick. Thank you. Um, we have the May invoice from Collier's. And Craig, I don't know if you want to say anything about this, but again, continue to be billed at our uh, agreed upon rate in our contract. I don't so have anything extra to add. Everyone can see the description here uh, of services. The invoice is for $10,978. Is that correct? That's correct. Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. So I'm going to move this to the consent agenda. If anybody objects, it's almost like the United States Senate. We have unanimous consent. Okay, Sean. Is this stuff that you guys are doing when I'm not here? Is there a consent, consent sure. approval Sean, now? Sean, was, Sean, yeah. keep going. Yes, yes. Uh, oh, keep going. Um, so just two other quick little updates. So uh, working with Craig to try to normalize a budget, you know, sort of some sort of budget update to give you guys um, at least once per month. Um, I know Collier's has some templates that they use and um, we're probably getting to the point where we can start using some of those and look at a, looking at them monthly. Um, and the other one is we are still working with FAA to finalize the contract. We're very close um the, the contract amendment we're very close there were a couple design services that um colliers you know identified were not in the proposal that this group looked at already once that we're going back with to them to say you know we need these design services as part of the project um so that's where we are still looking to get that done as soon as we can great thank you sean any questions about the financial update okay thank you uh, next item is correspondence. Uh, there is none that I know of. Next item is our topics not anticipated 48 hours in advance. There are none that I know of. Next item is public comment. Uh, it looks like we have five uh, members of the public attending and thank you so much for your attendance. And I see a hand up, Jeff Lee. Uh, can Jeff be unmuted? 
Sorry, I didn't mean to raise my hand there. Oh, okay. Well, thanks. Thanks anyway. Okay, so uh, any other member of the public wish to be recognized? Okay, I see no other public comment. I think we're done. So with your indulgence, let's adjourn. Stay well, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. All.